Welcome back to chapter 32. So we're picking up where we left off in the previous video. And now it's time for us to talk about transmutation of elements. That sounds harder than it really is. What it means is that you take a target nucleus and you bombard it with a projectile. The projectile, if it has enough energy, will enter the nucleus, make it unstable, cause the nucleus to emit some sort of energetic mass and then turn into a daughter element. So the parent nucleus, the, which is the target, has changed or transmuted. So we've got a target, in this case, a typical transmutation. We have lithium-6. We are slamming a deuterium, that's heavy hydrogen, hydrogen-2. So lithium-6 is the parent, parent, deuterium is the projectile. This N represents the, um, a neutron. So that is going to be the, the radiation that's given off. And then beryllium-7 is the daughter that's left behind. So this is the expanded format. So it's always the target and the projectile followed by an arrow, and then the radiation and the daughter. Now, sometimes rather than writing it out in this expanded form, we write it in this smaller contracted form with the parentheses, and it's still in the same order. The only thing you're missing are the plus signs and the arrow. So the first plus sign gets replaced with the open parentheses, the arrow gets replaced with a comma, the second plus sign gets replaced with a closed parentheses, and then we just have the daughter. So it's always target and resultant daughter on the outside, projectile and radiation on the inside. <clears throat> on the quiz, you should be able to go back and forth. So if I give you the parentheses notation, you should be able to write it in expanded form. If I gave you expanded form, you ought to be able to write it in parentheses notation. Okay, so let's look down a little bit. Let me scroll. So the probability that a particular reaction is going to take place is called its cross section, and it's measured in units of Barnes. If you want to make some sense out of these two terms, you can think about throwing balls at a target. So if you have Maybe you're at the fair and you're trying to knock down cans. So the cans are the target and the baseball they give you is um, the projectile. So the bigger the target, the easier it is to hit. Um, and the more likely you are to hit it. So the bigger its cross section, the cross sectional area, the easier it's going to be to hit it. So the greater the probability that you'll make contact. The term barn for the unit came about because when they did these first calculations, they were surprised by how large they turned out to be, even though they are very tiny numbers. And someone quipped, oh, it's as big as a barn and it's stuck. So one barn is one times 10 to the minus 28 meters squared. And it's used just to discuss cross section, which again is a measure of the probability. So the reactions take place if their Q values are positive. Now we've done Q values for alpha particles. I explained that other kinds of decay have different Q value formulas for these induced transmutations for taking a target, throwing a projectile at it, turning it into radiation emitted and a daughter. The Q value are the two things on the left added together uh, minus the two things on the right, or what you start out with minus what you end up with, and then times 931.5. So if we look at our equation, I'll scroll so we can see it. If we look at our equation again, this would be the, the target, the projectile. Uh, I've got these in opposite order. Probably this should have been B and then Y. Let's change it. Let's make that B and make this Y. There we go. Now it actually matches what we've had before. 
um, where it's what you start out with minus what you end up with. So starting out with target projectile, ending up with radiation emitted and daughter, and then times 931.5 MEVs per U, because these numbers are in U's, unified atomic mass units, and we need to change them into units of energy. We won't actually be doing these calculations, but I wanted you to know where they came from. So let's talk about what kind of Q values can you get. If you have a Q equal to zero, a Q is equal to zero, then we say we're at the threshold energy. So it's just barely enough. If conditions are right, then the reaction will take place. If the Q is greater than zero, then you have an exoergic reaction and it will occur spontaneously. So just because you throw a projectile at a target doesn't mean it's going to be absorbed, create instability, result in radiation being given off and a daughter being produced. That's not a given. Just because you throw the projectile at it does not mean the reaction will take place, but it will if the Q value is greater than zero. If the Q value is less than zero, it's an endoergic reaction. And the only way it can take place is if you add extra energy. You have to add extra energy. And we do that sometimes because these projectiles are sent at the target with specific energies. You can accelerate them by putting them through various magnetic fields and make them go faster and faster. And that will increase their energy which will, in the right set of circumstances, be enough to overcome the natural deficiency just in the basic Q value. All right. So equal to zero is threshold energy. Q greater than zero is an exoergic reaction, and it occurs spontaneously. And Q less than zero is endoergic, and it can occur unless you, it cannot occur unless you add more energy. So to force an endoergic reaction to take place, you have to supply that missing energy in the form of kinetic energy for your projectile. Most effective, the most effective projectiles are neutrons. They have no net electric charge. They're not repelled by the protons. And it's really easy for them to interact with the nucleus. So if we were going to do the math, and again, we're not, for this reaction, I'd have to look up the masses to calculate the Q value. And again, remember that what you start out with equals what you end up with. So the masses on the, the left minus the masses on the right times 931.5 will give us our Q value. And if we did it for this, we'd see it's 3.38. It's positive, so it's an exoergic reaction. It's going to take place. Let's look at nuclear fission. So fission is a reaction where uh, a target is bombarded by a neutron, and then it splits into two smaller nuclei, and that releases energy and more neutrons. And normally we talk about this in terms of what's called the liquid drop model. So fission is when your nucleus splits. So here's the little diagram. You have a slow neutron. It makes the uranium-235 unstable. It turns it to a uranium-236, which is unstable. When the middle stage actually splits, you have in this instance, uh, tellurinium-137 and zirconium-97. They both have energy associated with them and neutrons are being given off as well. So the, the zirconium and the tellurinium are the, the decay products and this results in two neutrons. Normally, fission reactions only absorb slow neutrons, but they produce fast ones. So to have it continue, you have to figure out a way to slow down the neutrons that are given off. The resulting nuclei, like I said earlier, called fission fragments. Every fission process will give off two to three neutrons. It varies depending on what the fission fragments are. 
So here's an example, um, different from the one in the diagram. There are dozens of possible fission fragments. The energy that's being released during fission is due to the Coulomb repulsion. And typically, each fission event releases roughly 200 MeV of energy. To put it in perspective for light bulbs, you can see that if you had a 100 watt light bulb and you, this is incandescent, and you used it for an hour, it would use 2.25 times 10 to the 18th MeVs. If we looked at that 200 MeV, we'd figure out how many nuclei of power it would give us. Uh, it would light that light bulb for 3.2 times 10 to the minus 13 seconds. That's not very long. But if you had 53 kilograms of uranium-235, which is quite a bit, you could um, create enough power for 1.42 times 10 to the six years. All right, which is a long time. Oops, I overshot, I apologize. So the energy of one fission event is really tiny, but the cumulative effect is great. When we look at these, we look at something called the chain reaction. So one fission releases two neutrons, which both have the potential for individually creating another fission event and so on. If you wanna think of chain reactions like setting up dominoes and knocking one over, you may because the processes can uh, continue to occur in a sequence. So now let's look at this little graphic. So for our graphic, you can see we have our first event. It absorbs, this is a slow neutron being absorbed. Two or three neutrons are given off and the daughter elements are created. When those interact, the neutrons interact with more nuclei after they've slowed down, because remember it absorbs slow but produces fast neutrons, they can continue. And so each generation, each iteration produces more events than the previous in a typical chain reaction. So maybe not so much like dominoes. In a fission reaction, it's dominoes but with a split in it. So we call some of these conditions the critical condition is the condition under which your chain reaction just continues at a steady rate. If it's a controlled chain reaction, well, we have those in nuclear reactors. If it's uncontrolled, well, you've made a bomb. To have a self-sustained chain reaction, you have to have at least one neutron produced for every fission event. The multiplication factor gives, which is abbreviated F, gives us the average number of neutrons per fission that go on to produce another fission. So if F is equal to one, we're in the critical condition. It's just sustainable. If F is less than one, you're in subcritical. It's not gonna continue probably. And if F is greater than one, it's in supercritical condition and you're gonna have a lot of events taking place. So let's look at non-breeder fission reactors. These are the kind that we have in nuclear power plants in the United States. They have a reacting core of fuel of uranium-235. They have a moderator to slow down the neutrons. Remember, the uranium, uranium absorbs slow neutrons but produces fast ones. So for the reaction to continue, you have to slow down the neutrons. The moderator is water in most reactors. Um, the original reactor was made with a graphite moderator. The reason we don't use them anymore is that graphite tends to overheat and be a fire hazard. So water is way safer. And then you have to have control rods. Control rods actually stop the nuclear reaction by absorbing the neutrons. So moderators slow down the neutrons so the reaction can continue control rods stop it by absorbing the neutrons. Typically control rods are made out of boron or cadmium or sometimes even a mix. The uranium in our power plants are, is typically in, in the natural state, uranium is 99.3% U238 and only 0.7% uranium 235. 
in our nuclear reactor, the fuel is only enriched to three or five, three to five percent uranium-235. The reason for keeping the enrichment level so low is that we want to make sure there's not enough uranium that a stray neutron could start an uncontrolled chain reaction. So it's a safety precaution to keep those enrichment levels really low. As I've said three times, I think already, uranium-235 captures slow neutrons and releases fast ones. So in the slowing down, when the moderator slows down, the energy that it removes from the neutron actually um, is absorbed by water. And then that water, that heat energy is absorbed by a different water, which boils to make steam to produce the power to produce the electricity. Um, and again, the control rods absorb the neutrons. They absorb neutrons. So let's look at a little graphic. I think I would like to see a little teeny bit more of it. Okay. So this is the containment vessel. And inside the red are the reacting core of fuel. This, this arrow is well, I'm not sure what they're pointing to, honestly. The reactor core is the whole thing. So the uranium are made in little pellets about the size of your thumb, and there are hundreds of them in these long fuel assembly tubes. Um, they're 12 or so feet long, and there's hundreds of them in a normal reactor. The control rods always come down from above so that if power is lost, gravity will just pull them down naturally. Um, the material inside the reactor core is, that's where we find the, the water, and it's there as a moderator to slow down the neutrons that are given off. Um, that water is pumped through a piping system that puts the pipe it's in in contact with the second container of water. And in this second process, it's there to actually boil the water in that second container and turn it into steam. And that steam drives a turbine and turns it into electricity. So the producing of the steam in a nuclear power plant compared to the producing of steam in a gas power plant or a coal burning power plant. The only difference is where does the energy come from to boil the water? So the water that's boiled, that's turned into steam, actually then gets, the steam gets condensed and turn back into water and it's pumped back into the system. So it's a closed loop. So we have several closed loops. The water that's used as the moderator is a closed loop. The water that's used as steam is a closed loop. And then there's water that's used to cool the steam and condense it. And that water is taken from some sort of nearby uh, water source like a lake or a river. So cold water comes in, condenses the steam and warm water exits, it's allowed to cool off before it's returned to the river or the lake that it came from. It cools off in either cooling ponds or cooling towers. Um, so there's a lot of water used by uh, a nuclear power plant, but most of it is a pass-through process. So the water is taken out of a nearby water source, but it's returned after it's cooled off to ambient temperature. They don't put hot water back in the, the river or the lake. They let it cool down to um, ambient temperature so it's not a shock to the ecosystem of the lake or the river. So back in 2010, there were about 30 countries that have four, that shared about 437 nuclear power plants. Um, in 2008, the total electric production was an enormous amount since the 1951 start. So a lot of electricity has been produced by uh, nuclear power. The United States has roughly 100 nuclear power plants. France is a close second and then Japan. Um, 
things are a little different now after the Fukushima power plant was hit by the earthquake and the tidal wave uh, that scared a lot of countries. The one good thing about nuclear power plants is you don't worry about greenhouse gases like you do with coal burning power plants. So we're not so worried about the greenhouse glass gases and global warming. But the downside to a nuclear power plant is you have to do something with the used up nuclear fuel, the spent fuel. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So there are all kinds of listings on the internet that can give you the name of the country and how many power plants there are. This graphic is not a recent graphic. And so I think we'll just skip past it. It was alphabetical. There, this is another graphic that's several years old with the total number of reactors. The United States does have a big lead. China was closing the gap. And after Fukushima, Japan stopped um, building power, nuclear power plants and closed some in fact. So again, you'll see the number of reactors, which is not the same as the number of power plants. Um, these are number of reactors in operation in 2016. China had the most followed by Russia and India and then the United States. Um, and it goes on. Number of nuclear power plants, plants under construction. France had a lot and you can see the list goes down. Japan didn't have any under construction. Whoops, I went too far. I did want to look at some of these other graphics. Oh, share of electricity generated in 2014. So again, France got virtually all of its electricity from nuclear power. There are some countries that got considerably less and some that got almost none. And this one shows the number of reactors worldwide by age. Um, you can see this is the middle years for them. Not too many brand new ones. Excuse me. You don't have these graphics as they were really not up to date or important. I do want to talk about what happens to the spent nuclear fuel. So after the fission events occur, the nuclear fuel in a reactor is divided up into three ages, if you will. There's the brand new fuel, the middle age fuel, and the old fuel. And at any one time when they change it out, they only change out about a third of the rods at a time. In the United States, spent nuclear fuel is stored for the most part on site at the reactor location. That was never the long-term goal. We were supposed to have reprocessing plants and there were, were big aspirations and they just haven't happened. So here's a map of the United States showing you where spent nuclear fuel is, is being stored. Um, whoops, I went too far. All right, let's see if I can get us back to where I want to go. Get our graphic back up. I may have to reduce it in size just so we can get it all on the page. All right, so what I want you to notice is that there are some states in the U.S. that have no spent nuclear fuel stored. Montana, Wyoming, North and South Dakota. Some have a lot. Uh, you'll see that in the eastern part of the United States, there's certainly more than in the western part. Nevada actually doesn't have any spent nuclear fuel there. Uh, Yucca Mountain was where we were supposed to store it, and it didn't pan out. New Mexico, interestingly enough, has spent nuclear fuel there, but not because of power generation, but because of research. So there are some places where there's government research labs and that's what's going on in New Mexico. In the eastern part of the US, 
it's a combination of research. There's research in South Carolina, and there's a combination also of um, nuclear power plants. There's, there's one in Charlotte. McGuire is a nuclear power plant. So let's move along and look at a slightly different version of this graphic. So this shows you commercial spent nuclear fuel storage. And again, you can see there are a whole lot more states where it's empty. These show that the nuclear fuel that was stored there in the previous graphic is for from government research facilities, not from commercial operations. Um, they, there are, like I said, so Yucca Mountain, which was in Nevada, was proposed as a site for spent nuclear fuel to be stored, but the people of Nevada revolted and the government relented. So now the proposal is to have two sites, one in New Mexico and then one across the state from it in, um, I'm sorry, I said New Mexico. Is that actually Arizona? I think it's, Oh, oh, New Mexico. Um, I'm going blank right now. And one across the state in Texas. And there's arguments about that right now. So I don't know what's going to happen. So yes, Carlsbad, New Mexico, they were supposed to have a facility near the, that. It's what's uh, proposed. And then in West Texas, Again, not very far from the Carlsbad location. So uh, both sites are opposed by locals, just like the Yucca Mountain one was opposed by the citizens of Nevada. So I'm not sure what's going to ever really happen with it all. Something needs to, though. So nuclear waste, there's a nuclear waste fund, which was collected with you had electricity generated by nuclear power, part of your power bill went towards the nuclear waste fund because they thought they were gonna to have to use that money to fund storage for it. And again, um, it's an amount, it's by broken down by state. So you can see South Carolina is right here. Um, Pennsylvania is next to it. And I'll be honest with you, I can't read this first one, so I'm going a little blank. Uh, let's see, New Hampshire is here. North Carolina ought to be in there. Here's North Carolina, right here. So they stopped collecting, I forget the year right now, this spent nuclear waste fund um, because they weren't doing anything with it. And the power companies say, hey, until you have a a chance to spin, we need to stop collecting. I need to increase this so you can read these words. <clears throat> right now, uh, it had about $24 billion in it. I'm not sure if they've actually taken some of that money for some testing of sites or not. So this is the big quandary as to what we're gonna do with those um, spent the, this nuclear fuel. Right now it's stored on site and it's either buried underground or it's above ground in canisters. Neither one is a long-term solution. <clears throat> there are other kinds of reactors. We have breeder fission reactors. They're, we don't have any of these in the United States operating for power production. With a breeder reactor, they use uranium-238. Usually liquid sodium is their coolant and they do have control rods. These type reactors breed more fuel than they use up. So the spent nuclear fuel could actually be used um, to fuel a second type of reactor. There was concern that um, the plutonium byproduct could be stolen by terrorist groups and then be used to uh, create nuclear weapons and so the United States doesn't have breeder reactors at this point in time. Here's a little graphic and it's on your online notes so you can look at it there. 
Now, fusion is our goal for the future. So fusion is different from fission. Remember, fission is you had a heavy nucleus, you bombard it with a neutron and it splits apart. Fusion is the opposite. You have two light nuclei coming together to form a heavier nucleus. So the fusion process releases energy coming from the strong nuclear force. There are some inherent problems with fusion. One is that you have to get it very, very hot. The uh, light nuclei, we predominantly use uh, hydrogen nuclei, has to be very hot. And that takes a lot of energy because you have a hot gas in the form of a plasma. To get it close enough together, you would have to use strong magnetic fields to condense the gas. Interestingly enough, the sun generates energy by way of the fusion process. So the energy from the sun is fusion. Here we would probably uh, take deuterium and tritium, two isotopes of hydrogen, bring them close enough together, they'd create helium, give off a neutron and energy. We would capture the energy and use it to boil water, to make steam, to produce electricity. So fusion reactors use deuterium again, two deuteriums to make a helium and a neutron or deuterium and a tritium. Obviously, the, the last one is the ideal mechanism because it gives the most energy. So we'd surround our core with a lithium blanket and we carry the heat energy away. So to have a fusion process, you need to have it at a high temperature. That's called the critical ignition temperature. You need a really high ion density. So those deuterium and possibly tritium nuclei have to be really close together. And you have to keep them close together for a, a, a discernible amount of time called the confinement time. We normally think of needing magnetic confinement to provide, uh, get those plasmas close enough together, the deuterium close enough together in order to have fusion take place. So we use magnetic confinement. This is a, a photograph of a fusion reactor in South Korea. This is a drawing of a uh, fusion reactor where the plasma goes round and round. Surrounding it is that magnetic field that condenses the plasma, gets it into a, a small tight area so fusion can take place. So some of the pros and cons, the pros, well, the fuel is cheap and abundant. You don't have weapons grade material. You aren't gonna have runaway reactions and it doesn't have much of a radiation hazard. Some of the cons, well, the plants are gonna be very expensive. You've got to have those uh, super magnets for uh, containing the plasma, high temperatures. There's gonna be structural damage because of the neutrons given off which over time will, again, you'll have to go in and correct. And there's a lot of heat energy produced and so there's a chance for some thermal pollution. In 2007, uh, a group of nations got together to create the ITER project. Uh, you can read the list to see who's involved in all of this. Um, the facility is in Southern France and they've made progress, although it's slow, it's a really large endeavor. You can see in 2009, it looked like an open field. In 2016, there were some buildings. In 2018, more buildings. I don't have a more recent photograph than that uh, it didn't seem necessary. So they are making progress. The, the, the real instance is that right now, you it takes more energy than you get out of it for fusion to take place. So Lockheed Martin is going a slightly different direction. They've invested heavily in small nuclear fusion reactors. 
uh, I'm sorry, I said fission earlier, but it's fusion, the bringing them together. So they've invested heavily in small fusion reactors. And the idea is that instead of building a you know, a massive multi-building site, they're trying to build really small ones with the notion being that the government would buy them to maybe power submarines or aircraft carriers or other things that instead of trying to, to power an entire city, maybe you only wanna look at doing one building at a time. And so they, they think there's a great potential to do it on a small scale. And they're hoping for government contracts when they get that far. So it seems very promising. It's conceivable that in your lifetime that we'll have nuclear fission, fusion reactors and not have to worry about spent nuclear fuel. So that would be a great thing. And this stops the chapter. I'm gonna stop our share and stop our recording.